All right, so the, the, the subject this morning is, is biblical unity, as was, was read for us from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Maybe a text, obviously, that we're very familiar with, and we understand its application generically, but we may need to make from time to time some specific lessons or applications in order to be more equipped to handle the problem of disunity or to handle the problem with whether or not we can have unity or not. So as we've already read, we learned that we are to endeavor to keep, notice as I've underlined it, underlined these words, unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, unity, spirit, and peace. Obviously the unity we can have has to be in concert or in harmony with the spirit, the spirit here being the Holy Spirit. As we learned from John 16 and verse 13, the Holy Spirit was uh, given to the apostles to guide them into all truth. Likewise, we learn from Hebrews, the fourth chapter and verse 12, that, of course, the word of God has the power to cut. And the word of God, of course, came originally from the spirit. The spirit's job or work was to deliver that message. Obviously, in context to delivering it to man, such as the apostles or prophets or other gospel writers, we would learn that the truth was from God himself, whom the Holy Spirit is a part of that. And of course, it has to be within the context of peace. Well, the peace cannot come, obviously, without the spirit, that is, which would deliver the truth. And obviously, we can only be unified in that. Therefore, that's what makes peace. Peace being, of course, that which makes for that, that which is tranquil, that which is, is peaceful, that which is without turmoil or strife. But of course, we cannot have peace at any cost. We can't have peace at all costs. We've got to have peace in context with that. So biblical unity is so important. And this particular verse of which we've read, we're not going to dissect it any more than we've already done. But what we do want to do this morning is we want to see or find a Bible example which can help us to understand how to develop the proper biblical unity. And so I have chosen this morning a text that we should be very familiar with, and that's the Acts, the sixth chapter, verses one through seven. You realize, friends, this is the very first challenge to fellowship in the New Testament church. There had been, at, at the time previously, great communion, commonality. There was uh, friendship. There was fellowship. The relationship, the partnership was perfect. In fact, they kept steadfastly the apostles doctrine acts 2 and verse 42 and acts 4 in verse 32 and following we learned that they shared and had all things in common so it wasn't just in the social or temporal aspects but it was in every way their spiritual connection to one another and everything was working well and then comes trouble we have more than 5000 souls by the time that we read this text here and we can only imagine how difficult that must have been the challenges they would have. I hope by the time we get done at the end, that we'll be able to see not only the specific issue here, but more importantly, how we would apply not this specific issue, although that could have come up, could come up in some context, but how this informs us how we use or utilize God's expectations of biblical unity, how we are responsible to one another in that regard, how we're responsible to ourselves in that respect as well. Things work out well. We already know that before we get to the end. We're thankful for that. So it's a very positive example. So let us notice these things, and I want you to pay attention to the things that I underline along the way. And of course, by the end, we'll have an application. So how did they handle the problem? Well, we know that when there was this great number of disciples that were multiplied, there came a complaint from the Hellenists. Hellenists is simply the Greek-speaking Christian, uh, Christians who were, of course, originally Jews. They're Jews just like the other Jews in one sense, but in another sense, not so. And the sense that they had become thoroughly cultured, if you will, in the Greek ways and the Greek practices and Greek speech because of their origins that they were distinct from those Judean, Galilean, 
Perean Jews. So this is what we're talking of here when we talk about the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Because their widows of Can were neglected in the daily distribution, of course, with this many Christians that came from all parts of the world who had not gone back after the day of Pentecost, there arose a great challenge of eating, feeding, the livelihood that they would need, that they would have already returned home for. And so it makes good sense that the church would gather together the proceeds that they could, uh, com that they could uh, uh, accumulate between in order to help these brethren. In other words, to distribute those things. Well, apparently along the way, regardless of the reason, there was a neglect. It is not dismissed at ha offhand or off cuff as if it's some uh, silly complaint, some petty complaint, some envious or jealous complaint, but rather a very real one. Because the 12, it says in verse 2, summoned the multitude of the disciples. And then, of course, they proceed to explain how they're going to address this matter how the problem is going to be solved. And that is going to be important for us to see. Number one, there was contention that challenged the fellowship. And we need to see that. It could have been handled differently and it could have destroyed the fellowship. It could have created a division in the early days and the church could have been split. And therefore they could have been, as we would say, a Grecian contention of the church. And then a, 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 a Jewish long before we ever read of the first Gentile convert, Cornelius but it was handled. It could have divided the church such that there was no communion or fellowship between any and that the church would dissolve. But we see that does not happen either because it was handled well. Notice the neglect for the food for the distribution of the Jewish Christians was under consideration and the complaint was handled very wisely. Notice that I have underlined the congregation chose. We'll come to that very point in just a few moments. But they chose seven men of good reputation and full of the Holy Spirit to serve the tables whom we or they may put in charge. Verse 3. Now that's important to note because it was a divine pattern that would work well. In other words, finding this particular issue uh, that needed to be addressed, they found a way to accommodate that obviously, without neglecting their duties, as we will see in just a few moments. But notice who was involved. That's the important part. The congregation was involved. It wasn't a contingency of the men that decided this matter. It wasn't the elders that got together in some dark room or quiet place and decided this matter. It wasn't the holy apostles. Now, we know at this point in time, there doesn't seem to be uh, elders. That will come along shortly. However, for this, they had the apostles. They had the apostles who were the primary leaders and directors of the church there in Jerusalem. But again, they did not choose for themselves. In fact, they said, you call the congregation together. You call the body of believers together, and then you make a choice as to whom you would use. And of course, the outline was seven men, and they must be of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, serve and uh, that they may serve the tables. In other words, a spiritual decision was made for a physical need, and of certain, God chose, in this particular case, the Holy Spirit talked through the apostles to make this choice. We have the divine revelation, and so we can take patterns like this and say, well, we certainly, even when we have a physical need among us, need to have men that are of a good reputation, that who is that cannot be their their conduct and their character cannot be impugned full of the holy spirit we won't take time to to uh, address the fullest um, potential meaning in this i do not think that it demands that they have powerful gifts in other words gifts manifest or given to them although that could be and later on we will find that they do because we will see philip in particular practicing those in samaria but again, full of the Holy Spirit can also, also mean that those who are full of the understanding and the knowledge and the practice and conduct of which the Holy Spirit had given the apostles and therefore the Christians. In other words, their Christian conduct and their Christian practices and their uh, adherence to the Word of God and their, their careful attention to that. They were full of the Holy Spirit. They were spiritual creatures, you see. And so that they would be qualified to serve 
the tables, but the congregation again chose. Next, we notice that the apostles handled the complaint in this way. And that it says that they should not leave the word of God because it says it's not desirable that we should do so. We must give ourselves, they say in verse four, continually to prayer and to the mystery of the word. Again, notice that they should not leave the word and that they should give themselves continually to these works, prayer, and to the ministry of the word. We'll come back to that as well. How did the whole congregation respond and why? Well, they approved. Why would they not approve? Because what they had been given to choose from was men who have spiritual capacity. They have spiritual characters and qualifications in order to do this job well. And what we learn, we learned that the church took the information that was given to them and then chose the seven men that would be appointed that we have the desired effect. We have unity in the spirit, as we learned from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. This unity of the spirit would, again, create the environment and establish the case for peace. They desired unity of the spirit. It wasn't that they desired unity at all costs. Again, they understood the apostles' work was in the word and in prayer. And consequently, then they understood that there were other men that needed to do this job and that they needed qualifications that ensured that there would be no new problems arise, or at least the problems within that context to arise. And that all could come together under understanding that a work was done that solved the need that they had at hand. So they desired the unity of the spirit. Next. And this is a very important hint, I suppose, but the reason that they chose the men they had, and I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but everyone in that list have Greek names. And what that tells us is that they were not Judean Jews. They may have lived near or in the land in some region or some place, but they certainly had Grecian backgrounds, or at least the names indicate that they would. Notice again the list of names that were chosen among them. We find that among the names, Stephen, of course, who was full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. These men were set before the apostles. And as I said before, each one of these were Grecian names. And all of them, it appears, probably lived outside, maybe, say, for Philip, who lived in Caesarea, which is along the seacoast, just south of, of the Tyre and Sidon region near Joppa. Nicholas, of course, has the distinction of being the proselyte. And Philip and Stephen, we know outside this text, one for Stephen's sermon and his subsequent death uh, by stoning, and then Philip by his work in Acts chapter 8 in the city of Samaria, what we learn is this is wise judgment in the work. In other words, examining what was needed, they made good decision to pick men who would have relieved the, uh, the, um, the feelings or the emotions or the possibility of, of preferential treatment from the congregation. These men would satisfy the need. Remember, their first qualifications were spiritual. Secondly, we learn that by distinction, they had Grecian names. And so it was important that we see that there was wise judgment at work. And that's also important for us to remember later on. What preceded the choosing of the seven? Well, as we've talked about before, the apostles would not or would, would be needing to work in ministry and prayer, therefore. They wouldn't leave the table, they would not be suitable for the tables at this time. In other words, their work was very important spiritually. Though that there were the tables needed to be served, they could be served by others. But at the same time, that does not make it a non spiritual work. For we notice that they prayed and they laid hands on them by the apostles. The laying on the hands is another important phrase. Sometimes it denotes that there is an imparted spiritual gifts or spiritual gifts have been imparted by laying on hands on other occasions laying on hands simply means approval a divine edict if you will in this particular case it would it would be the appointment being exercised 
they prayed and they laid hands, much as we see in Acts the 13th chapter, when the church at Antioch laid hands upon Barnabas and Saul. They didn't do this, of course, because they had the authority or power from God, divinely approved, but rather they were approving what had already been told them by the Holy Spirit. But either way, we see there's a spiritual motivation, right? And that is a very important aspect when we talk about uh, unity and the spirit and the bond of peace and how we handle problems. These apostles understood that. So praying and laying on of hands show that there was a spiritual motivation behind their work. But what three things happened after this? Well, first of all, the word of God spread. And that's important. And secondly, the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. That is of very uh, much importance as well, as we will see. It, of course, happened there in Jerusalem, but that's where the church is. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. That's also going to be important to our final application as well. So remember, three things came out of their exercise. In fact, you might think of these things indirectly related. In fact, they may appear to be, and you might even not even consider them being connected at all. You might not even say this would be the result thereof, but we need to see that in the inspiration of the scriptures, that these were this, this matter, this statement of fact, this re recurring or, or, or resulting effect, has everything to do with what already occurred. That when they laid their hands upon these men who had been pre-approved, that they had decided that the word of God, again, the word of God would be fulfilled. That they would pray, that they would give their time as apostles to such, that they would also give their time to the word, and that they would find spiritual men in the church to just take care of the gap or the need. And therefore, it caused others to pay attention. It caused the energies of the apostles to be spent in the areas that needed to be. And therefore, the word of God would spread. The disciples would multiply greatly. And then those outside, even among the priests, would be obedient to the faith. So what are the essential lessons? We all have to choose to participate participate in the spiritual work of the body of Christ. We've already seen that when we said the congregation chose. You see, friends, we don't have an option in this. We may choose not to, but to choose is to make a choice. We have to participate in the work of the local body of which we are a part of. If we do not, then we are failing our responsibilities. We are now going to be accountable before God for that. And we better be serious about this. We better pay attention. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 12 through 27 makes clear that there is no one that's not essential. Everyone is important. An eye, a hand, a foot, none of them. The least part among us cannot be considered non-essential. Likewise, Romans the 12th chapter will tell us very plainly that we have a work to do and that we cannot uh, neglect that charge, and we need to exercise it with the utmost. When he talks about the exhortation, when he talks about the giving and the works of ministry, we are to do those with all of our might, with the greatest ability that we have. And when there are hard decisions to make and difficult things to decide, then we have to choose to participate in the work of the church. Everything that the church does must have a spiritual connectivity and if it does, then we are to work with that. Secondly, we all are to desire unity in the spirit. Not unity at all costs, not unity from any other standard, not a democracy. The church is not such, but it is a theocracy. It is ruled by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are to fall in line with that. And therefore, desiring unity is in the spirit should be our primary goal. And when we do that, and of course, we will be interested in participating in the spiritual work. Third, we must have men who can exercise wise judgment. You know, we talked about the judgment and the wisdom of picking these men who had Grecian backgrounds or Grecian names. Well, that was pretty wise, wasn't it? Especially when we understand the ones that were neglected. It would ease the tensions. It would relieve the fears, you see. And therefore, they would work, would continue on. It would flourish. It would grow. 
if we call some of the things that we'll talk about in just a few moments. We must have men who will exercise wise judgment. As a church, of course, we are accountable and responsible to find men among us who are qualified to be elders. Now, if we do not have them, then we must work toward that goal. But when we do have them, we need to appoint them because we do not have the apostles today. We have the written word of God that the apostles passed down or handed down to us. And it is our guidebook in order to choose men, to select men who will shepherd us as 2 Timothy chapter, or excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus 1 make very clear. So we must exercise wise judgment. And then we must believe that great growth and unexpected results can happen. You see, that's the, the point that we made about the fact that it says that a great many, uh, uh, the word uh, uh, grew or multiplied, that the congregation grew, and that even among the priests, they were those who obeyed. You know, that is remarkable in and of itself. You see, first of all, what happened was, is that the people around them recognized this church was exercising things that was probably almost unheard of and very rare in Jerusalem at the time. Not because it should be so, for the Jewish law demanded that they cared for one another, they cared for the poor. And so within the context of the Jewish faith, they should have been taking care of one another, and that should not have come to any surprise. But we know it was not so. And the Lord had expectations of his church. He had great desires and hope for his church to be unified in the spirit and the bond of peace. And therefore, they found the way. They found the righteous solution. They found a way that would help them stay unified as a spiritual body and not be in conflict with God's word. And so what happened? Others that were looking from the outside were seeing these things. The apostles were relieved of their physical responsibilities so that they could pursue the spiritual since they were the main line of teaching at the time. Later on, by Acts the eighth chapter, we learn that many others will do the same thing. In Acts chapter eight and verse four, the church was scattered and they went everywhere preaching the gospel. And we see the effect of that throughout the book of Acts as well as the epistles. Well, again, the word of God would have its a day. It would have an occasion. Why? Because there were other men who could fulfill this responsibility. And so the apostles were relieved of their duty. So the word of God spread. And so because the word God spread, then likewise, those who were hearing and heeding the word would obey and therefore become a part of the number. So the number would grow. That would only help the church in its maturity and its faith. It would help them in these other responsibilities they would have and the challenges they would have even with the physical needs. All these things would be so. And then the third thing that we noticed in the text that probably is something you may not have considered, maybe you have, but I think it's remarkable and it is worthy of note. And that is that a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. When you consider that the priests derived their livelihood from the work in the temple, this is no small task. This is mo no small thing that they became obedient to the faith. They gave up their livelihoods. They became now destitute themselves. Likewise, their social and interactions and connections would be all because of their priesthood. They would likely, because of the priest, being priest, have very little other resources because they originally would not have cities or, or, or countries or lands themselves. The priest, again, derived their livelihood from the temple or the tabernacle originally. Likewise, their numbers, though they would be many at this time, would still be small enough that everyone would know them. So when persecution did rise, arise, can you just imagine who would be first on the list? Who would be known before any others that could be singled out for persecution and all the tensions that would come from that? These men gave up a great deal. There's a great cost but you notice that they observed the workings of the church and they understood the teachings of the apostles and they realized what they had or what they were offered was something very real, something that was eternal, something that, that would carry them beyond the life that they live at the present. And it was worth it. They had counted the cost. And so a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Final thoughts for our edification is, what do we learn about leadership? It need, we need it. 
and we need it for good works to be done. We need good leadership. Sometimes it may not be able to uh, come in the form of shepherds because of the qualifications. Uh, and, 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 and if we lack those, then I understand that. Sometimes it may come from other avenues, men that are more mature in the faith, but they don't meet all the qualifications, but it must come. We need good leadership. In other words, we need persons who are mature in the word of God and understand it well, that the work may be done. Secondly, we learn also that congregational participation is absolutely necessary. We got to have a buy-in, as we would say. We have to realize that there's a commitment that each of us have to make to that. It isn't just merely some men, whether they be shepherds or a group of men making decisions. Oh, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Certainly they lead in that task and they qualify that, of course, by the scriptures. And because of the maturity and judgment, they can understand what we should or should not be doing in regards to the work of the church. But we understand that we have to accept that and put ourselves in place or in work. We've got to be asking, where is my place? We've got to be asking, what do you need me to do? We must be able to observe maybe what we are to do and then put our hands to the task. We must make decisions at times. The easiest thing to do is to step back and allow elders and others to make decisions and you accept the results. And when things don't go well, then you're not accountable, you believe, or you're not responsible. But as I said before, to not make a decision to participate is a decision in and of itself. And that you're not going to be able to escape accountability when it's all said and done. Because the Lord has expected us to make ourselves uh, a part of a local church. Acts, the ninth chapter, in the tensions that were surrounding whether or not Saul of Tarsus should be accepted or not, we learn that we are accountable to join. While Christ died for his church, that is the universal body of believers that are all over the world, each one of us, as we read throughout the Acts, as well as the epistles, are accountable to make ourselves uh, 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 acceptable, responsible, and presentable to a local body, ready for work, ready for the task, because we need, again, to assemble, to encourage one another, to stir one another up to love and good works, Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 24. And this does not imply democracy rule by any means. Nor does it mean that all of us have an equal voice, depending upon our abilities, our understanding, our maturity. Uh, there's a lots of, of things to consider, but does not change the fact that we all, we all are expected to participate, and it is necessary. I got a few things as we close out that I want to read for you, or, or, or points, I should say, that, you know, we could do a lesson in and of itself just in these categories alone. But when we talk about the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, there are a few things that we need to consider. Number one, in order to be biblical about it, to, to understand God's design, first we must decide that unity can only come when we've agreed upon the truth. We are people who are to worship God in spirit and in truth, and we're accountable to adhere to that. If there is something that is of error, we cannot participate. We can't have any part of it. Remember in Galatians, the first chapter, verses 6 through 10, we had a church, churches, excuse me, that had decided error was a good path, that they had added, of course, circumcision to the work of the church, and that cannot be. Likewise, we also understand that we cannot decide that we condone or support error in any way. So therefore, we can have unity in that. It's going to be a hard thing, indeed. We may have to decide at some point to, to separate ourselves from we hope that that is not the case. We're supposed to correct error, to convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering was Paul's admonition to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. However, we got to understand truth has to prevail. Whether we stick it out and we strive and we work hard and in some point in the future, we're able to correct good. If we're not and we have to remove ourselves, we still have adhered to truth. So we cannot... We cannot have unity without truth. Secondly, we've got to have unity based upon an appeal for scriptural decisions. In other words, spiritual decisions, whether in the matter of judgment or whether in matter of, of truth, we need to say, what would God want me to do? What would be best for my family? Even if there are choices to make, we've got to study things out sometimes. Some subjects are very difficult. 
Sometimes we're not quite sure. Maybe they're, they're, they're complicated and complex. We're discussing maybe head coverings, the assembly, what constitutes assembly, what it constitutes when we participate in the Lord's Supper. We all agree that it's on the Lord's day. Is there a second offering by the second time, et cetera? There's a lot of things that we may discuss, and there may be things much minor, maybe some things just as great, but you understand my point. Human judgment is not going to be acceptable. We have to make a decision, even in matters of judgment, I assure you. But we need to make judgments based upon spiritual criteria. And then when we have to make a decision, and we're still not sure, we make sure that we're safe in our pursuits, and that we're honest in our pursuits, and that we do not violate conscience. In Romans the 14th chapter, that which is not of faith is sin. And what he's saying very plainly is that if I choose to bend my judgment, even though it is against what I would believe otherwise, then that has become sin. So we've got to be careful to understand these things that, again, when it comes to personally applying things and the conditions that are to be met, that I'm very careful and deliberate, and that I consult others and consult the Word of God primarily, and I'm involved in prayer. And the third thing is probably more vital than all well, not necessarily than the other two that I mentioned, but very vital. And I think one that we probably overlook, maybe we don't even think about. But in order to make a decision and based upon the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, first of all, we need to consider personally, is there something that I'll violate in my conscience if I do such a thing? Is there something that I, I need to reconsider? And I'm not quite sure in mentioning the head covering. There are brethren that I have very deep been an abiding respect and love for that choose uh, that uh, choose to do that mainly because of safety's sake, because they're not certain that it is not so. And so they have not decided that it is all right, so therefore they do. I have to respect that, you see. And it has to be personal, you see. But secondly, it also has to be congregational because sometimes it's about our, again, unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Paul was saying to the Ephesian church, you are responsible to one another. Therefore, you have to decide those matters. You have to agree that there are some things that we must be able to do together in order to be qualified as the Lord's church here. First, we have to maintain the truth. There's no question about that. But even when we have to make decisions that we are discussing those things among ourselves, it's not be decided based upon a congregation to a congregation. We can't look out to others to make the decision for, well, church so-and-so does this, therefore we will do that. Church so-and-so does this, and we believe them to have a, a very good grasp on the scriptures and be very spiritually minded, so they must know what is right, so therefore that's what we do or because we have great respect. Maybe a certain number of us have a great deal of reverence or respect for a, a, a set of elders or a group of elders in another church or a preacher. That's not going to work either. And then also in connection to that thought, we cannot be looking out among us nationally. The government says this, our community says that. When we decide our work, when we decide our worship and our work and everything that we do, based upon external things such as nation, other congregations, religious community, the community that we live in, that we've already aired. Because God says, look into his word first. And once we look into his word and we are still troubled about the decision because we can't find an exact thus say it, and there are some things to consider, then we must be able to discuss among ourselves, making good judgment personally as well as collectively. And we must do that together. And we cannot be looking from or to the, those that are outside. It's imperative that we see our responsibilities in these, this regard. It's imperative that we see that we, are, we, we understand that we cannot have in, intimidation or we cannot have uh, our focus upon those things, again, that are not spiritual to make our decisions. Our decisions have to be based upon we are Christians first and foremost. Number one, First, in order, but most importantly, primarily, we're Christians, and therefore all of our decisions are informed by such. So let us make sure that we consider these things when we talk about our work. Are there any among us that need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? Then I want to encourage you this day to consider your faith, 
Consider what's going to happen this day if the Lord returns and repent. And once you repent of your sins, confess Jesus as the Lord and Savior and be immersed in water for the remission of your sins, arise and walk in new life. Will you do that? And just maybe we're, 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 we're not settled in our faith because we have wavered and we have been tossed and we've had doubt and maybe we even now have sinned. Let's repent of that. Can we help you with this? Do you need to confess and repent any sins? Whatever your needs are, please come.